tonight, a flood of lawsuits after New York makes a major change to laws concerning sexual abuse. We're going to hear from victims and their attorneys. Then, tons of new developments and complications regarding the death of Jeffrey Epstein. Now, alleged victims, they're going after the estate. Also, part three of our special report on the legalization of recreational marijuana. Tonight, we'll take a look at whether it's impacting quality of life issues and the crime rate. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. We start off with some breaking news tonight coming out of Philadelphia. This alive look in in North Philly. Police say five officers have been shot that after responding to a call in Nicetown neighborhood. Now, they have been brought to area hospitals. Their conditions not considered life threatening. Police say it is an ongoing and active situation that was part of a narcotics bust. We'll continue to keep you posted. Now on to Wall Street where stocks, they were hammered today. The Dow plunging 800 points. That is some new flash a major warning sign about a possible looming recession. And there are new fears about a global slowdown after China and Germany show new signs of real trouble. Plus, the U.S. trade war with China, that's not helping markets as uncertainty remains. In the meantime... A major new law has just taken effect in New York State and is prompting a flood of civil lawsuits over sexual abuse cases. The Child Victim Act, it just kicked in at midnight, this past midnight, and it opens a one-year window for victims to file suits against people and institutions accused of abusing them. And it doesn't matter how long ago the abuse happened. Files one's Ray Ramundi, he has more. It, it was like clockwork with him. It was the same thing every time. He'd make you sit on his lap and face him and fondle you and worse. For child sex abuse survivor Rich Klein, August 14th has been a date he's been waiting for for over five decades. For myself and for many of the victims, it's an opportunity for justice. It's the day, according to new state law, where survivors will have a one-year open window to seek legal justice against their alleged abusers and the institutions who hid the crimes in secrecy. The Child Victims Act, referred to by many as the CVA, will allow all victims of child sex abuse and assault access to civil courts, regardless of how long ago the abuse occurred. People are put on notice that you're not going to get away with this. There's going to be a price to pay. Rich Klein is one of hundreds filing against Rockefeller University, where Klein says he, along with thousands of other children, were abused. Rockefeller University is just one of dozens upon dozens of institutions who will be sued in Supreme Courts all across the state of New York. One of the primary purposes of opening this window is for people to become more enlightened about the risks to children and, and, and the predators that are among us. James Marsh is representing hundreds of child sex abuse survivors across the tri-state area, including Rich Klein. Is going to be the Archdiocese, which covers the Hudson Valley. Um, you've also got the Boy Scouts, which were, you know, at their peak in the 60s and the 70s when a lot of this was happening. James Marsh says on August 14th, he will be filing more than two dozen civil cases here at Westchester County Supreme Court. Many of those civil cases will be directly aimed at churches across the state of New York. In fact, Marsh says civil cases will be filed against seven of the eight archdioceses across the Empire State. In a statement sent to Files One News, a spokesperson from the Archdiocese of New York said this about pending civil lawsuits. Quote, we do not know what will transpire over the course of the coming year, but we do know the independent reconciliation and compensation program, which we began in 2016, has helped over 325 victim survivors find a sense of justice and closure. The Westchester County DA's office and a team led by Special Prosecutions Division Chief Fred Green continues to work diligently to look back at possible criminal prosecution against child sex abuse crimes from decades ago. But the institutions helped the abusers get away with it. Now that's all stopping as a result of the Child Victim Act. And so that's a tremendous accomplishment for young people and for crime victims. I hope that by speaking out with others, that we can save future children who could be in the situation, encourage them to speak out when something's not right. As we wait to see how institutions handle the onslaught of civil cases, a semblance of justice and empowerment for those survivors who will have their day in court on this day and beyond. For Richard French Live, I'm Ray Mundy.
Attorney Michelle Simpson-Teagle, she joins us now. She's working on 15 cases that were filed today and also represents 170 other clients in the state of New York. Uh, Michelle, try and put in context. We've given a lot of numbers and the background on this, but it just can't be exaggerated how seismic and significant when the clock struck 12 last night, how it changed potentially many thousands of lives. Yes, it did. I mean, today is... It's really symbolically important to a lot of the survivors in New York and the clients and survivors we represent, but it means so much more to many of our clients than just the filing of a lawsuit, because what the Child Victims Act and these lawsuits really allow is for our clients to finally get information and for the curtain to be pulled back and for these institutions and abusers to finally be held accountable. So it's a lot, it's about a lot more than just the lawsuits. We understand uh, that the New York State court system has set aside 45 judges just for what they expect to be a wave of suits. Um, do you think that's only a fraction of the judges that will be needed here, considering some of the, the cases we've talked about where they could come from, not just as it relates, obviously, to the archdiocese. You have um, uh, Rockefeller University, as we talked about, Boy Scouts, Jehovah Witness. The list goes on and on organizationally, forgetting even individually. Um, do you believe the system is going to be prepared to handle for what's now coming down the pike? I do believe that the judges know what they're doing. I mean, New York is a state that has handled a lot of highly complex and voluminous litigation. And so I think they have mobilized and they will continue to be fluid as we figure out exactly how many cases are coming in. And I think we can see from the court's press release and orders that they've already issued that they are planning for this. Do me a favor. Uh, we mentioned uh, that you have several clients um, where this isn't just a symbolic date, but this is obviously uh, their day in court. Put a human face uh, on the kind of uh, clients that have come through your door and, and now are bringing suit. Um, give us some of their stories as best you can. Well, I think about one of my first clients who came forward publicly in New York earlier this year, Rafael Mendoza really brave man who lives in New York. He's 37. He was abused at his high school, Cardinal Hayes High School, by John Paddock, who at the time that Mr. Mendoza came forward was still an actively serving priest in a church, Church of Notre Dame on the Upper West Side. And, you know, really him coming forward and some other survivors coming forward earlier this year resulted in him eventually stepping down during a pending investigation and not being in service anymore. But it's sad that that's what it took. You know, one of the things uh, I'm not so sure people on the outside know is you had people who came forward, I'm sure to even yourself, Michelle, who said, I have a story to tell, I want to come forward. And you would have had to in the past tell them, sorry, the statute of limitations has lapsed. Um, you won't have your day in court. This look back, I'm, I'm curious, did you go back to certain people and say, I know we before said you couldn't do anything because the law stipulated that the window had closed, but the window's open again. Um, let's reinvestigate where we can go from here. Uh, were some of the conversations people not just knocking on your door, but you going back to people that you couldn't have helped in the past but now can? We've definitely had those conversations. My least favorite conversation or the ones where I have to say I can't help you right now. But the best conversation are the ones where we've been able to go back, just like you said, reach out to people who we had had contact with, who had wanted to move forward with some sort of a lawsuit or legal case. And we get to tell them that you have your right now. We can move forward. And and that is both a hard thing, but a really it can be a very healing process for the clients. For these large organizations, Michelle, uh, they've already hinted, or if not threatened outright bankruptcy if the scope of um, the cases against them are of such that they just can't support it financially. How worried are some of the people that they'll have a pyrrhic victory of sorts, that they'll go public with the trauma that happened to them, but there'll be little justice other than sorry? Well, and that question comes up with a lot of clients because we've heard whisperings of potential bankruptcy with some of the smaller dioceses in New York as well as the Boy Scouts of America. And what I tell my clients is, is we've dealt with that before. 
I represented and still represent a number of the women, the Olympic and national team gymnasts who were abused by Larry Nasser. And uh, months ago, USA Gymnastics declared bankruptcy. And so we are going through that process with other clients and other sexual abuse litigation. And what I can tell you from that experience and from other experiences is that is not the end of the road. People hear bankruptcy and they think, I'm not gonna get any justice or I will never get the information or have my day in court. But what I am seeing through the process of bankruptcy, which I've been really involved in in the gymnastics cases, is that you still have a right to information, you have a right to justice, they have a right to hearings and trials, and does it slow down the process and would, would we prefer not to go there? Of course, but it is not uh, the end of the road and we can still get them justice and answers even if we have to go through the bankruptcy process. Well, you have, um, I'm sure, a very busy year plus ahead of you. Uh, but, Michelle, I appreciate the time you were able to give us today. Best of luck. We appreciate it. And discuss where these suits go from here. Let's bring in Doug Von Oist. He's a founding partner of Carson Von Oist, focusing on corporate misconduct, also selected by Legal 500 as one of the most influential trial lawyers in the nation. And, Doug, it seems that there's windows in time where there is um, n not just a case, but an epidemic of something that captures the nation's attention. It captures lawmakers. Um, obviously, we saw in Albany, they, they've literally changed the law in terms of statute of limitations and this look back. Um, but is the law almost catching up to the new, not just Me Too generation, but now an acknowledgement that there was horrific sexual assaults that took place, sometimes abetted by organizations, um, national organizations at that, and how the prosecution of this is, it's almost seeming like a race to the courthouse door. Clock strikes midnight and everybody starts filing. Um, is the system prepared to handle it? Well, I think the system is getting prepared to handle it. Apparently, they assigned a lot of judges that are going to step in and handle these cases exclusively. But it is the law catching up with what's going on. So you have something called a statute of limitations, X amount of time to bring your lawsuit. These the events that occurred here that we're talking about happened a long time ago, so the statute of limitations is gone. So legally, people couldn't bring lawsuits. When they went to the courthouse, they brought a lawsuit. The lawsuit was dismissed because they, the statute of, viola, sure. uh, statute of limitations. Now the law is catching up, saying we are acknowledging a glitch in the system, and we're going to try to change that so these people can bring these lawsuits. Um, but in the case of the archdiocese or Boy Scouts or whatever the organization is, they're not class action suits, right? These are individual suits. How do they decide the priority? Who gets hurt first? There's a limited amount of resources one would think that would be able to satisfy for the pain and suffering these people um, felt, especially if the perpetrators are dead now and the organizations um, are gonna bear responsibility, at least financially. How do they decide who goes first, how far the money goes? It's not like we've dealt before with Feinberg, right? There's not a master here who's going to decide how to allocate funds. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, you're talking about two separate things. If you're talking about the, how the, what case is going to actually go forward and be heard in the court, well, that's going to go towards the individual judges will be assigned cases. There will be a discovery process. When the discovery is completed, that judge will decide which case is going to be heard, which, whether it will go out and be heard by a bench or a jury. When you're talking about money, you're talking about once you've decided to settle the case or there's been verdicts and now you're trying to collect in, in the form of a judgment. Well, that sort of, that, that can get a little dicey because if the entity that you've sued goes bankrupt, well, then you're all in bankruptcy court and you're deciding how to cut up the, the, the resources of the company. Um, the idea of going back this far in time and obviously all the things that make it more difficult, um, witnesses' recollections, I, I even witnesses being around at the time, uh, the defendant even being able um, to stand trial and defend himself or not, or even to uh, acknowledge uh, the, the misdeeds, etc. How hard is this? Is this going to basically be, you know, whose word do you trust? I would imagine there's not a lot of physical evidence. Well, I mean, Rich, it's done, it happens with asbestos lawsuits because of the latency period. You're looking back at 30 years in the past. But it is, you have to acknowledge the fact, listen, you, when you're talking about pedophiles, it's not very, 
a popular position to talk about the difficulty of a pedophile defending themselves. But you have to acknowledge the fact that when you are bringing a lawsuit many, many, many years after the events took place, it becomes very difficult. So if the, in the case of the church or the Boy Scouts, if they're going to be responsible for something an individual did in that, in, within that organization, now they're defending themselves back. There won't be the witnesses around that they can turn to. And we're certainly not saying that people are fabricating the stories, but you have to acknowledge the fact that these become very difficult for people mm. to, to defend themselves. But they're also very difficult for people to step, ahead, step forward and say, this happened to me. All right, stay with me, Doug, because when we come back, we're going to talk about the cases captured the nation's attention. Um, and speaking of Child Victim Act, how this is also impacting the Jeffrey Epstein case. Even though the billionaire accused of sexual abuse is dead now, that does not end uh, the questions and the investigations. We'll explain after this.